uh, this is hopefully going to be a really fun session. Um, I did gear this more towards uh, folks that are new to this, um, people that are really more interested in understanding how folks draw uh, with tablets and you know, um, you know, iPads and things like that, but also kind of understanding some of the drawing basics that folks either sometimes may not have had the experience of, or the privilege of going to art school uh, or you know, ha having the time to be able to really dig into where to start. So that also brings us to why I called this uh, Digital Drawing 101 and, or all these squares make a circle because pixels are little squares and you can make circles with them. So, <laughs> so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is John Neeland and I have been doing this for quite a while. Uh, started drawing when I was in middle school, really started uh, picking uh, things up more in high school, started experimenting with a lot of traditional media because that was what was available. Um, and then digital kind of came into my purview around uh, 2000, 2001. Uh, that's when I started reaching out um, and trying to learn more because there really wasn't a whole lot available. Uh, so like Photoshop was, you know, becoming more of an industry standard. Uh, Illustrator was becoming a thing. Uh, Corel Painter was starting to have some really great software. So I kind of reached out to each one of them and uh, started establishing contacts. And, and uh, it's led me to my career today. So what you're going to see is pretty much what drove me to my career for UX and UI because of my love of digital and illustration. So to start off, I want to talk a little bit about what the differences are between the two. So there's a lot of pros and cons for each one of these. Uh, I feel there are probably more cons for traditional versus digital, but let's get into it. So traditional, it's kind of like unique. I mean, you go to an art museum and you can get a print of the Mona Lisa, but you'll never have the Mona Lisa. All uh, these individual traditional works that people create, pen and paper, sculpture, whatever, there's only one of them. And even if they are reproduced or mass reproduced, there's always that like, what was the first? What was the original? And that's kind of, uh, that's very important to a lot of people as to having that original piece. It, it has a lot, it, it kind of has a life of its own. And a lot of that is due to the imperfections that comes with it. So whatever it is and whatever makes it unique, that's where people uh, find additional value. Um, another is uh, being able to make art out of things that's not digital. It could be anything you find around the house. It could be a pen and paper. It could be Play-Doh. It doesn't matter whatever you make your digital art with uh, or even what you draw with or paint with. It's just that it's a, most of the time that stuff is a little less expensive. I mean, a mechanical pencil and a drawing tablet can probably run you about 10 bucks. However, some of the cons about this is that you can't really fix anything when you make a mistake. Uh, they last forever or you have to learn to live with them. Uh, you can't really make, like I said, you can't even make these identical copies. Uh, I mean, aside from mass production. Uh, and then like, when you do run out of materials or you run out of paint, you've got to go to the store and get more. That doesn't really happen on digital. So what I really like about digital itself and what really draw, what drew me to it initially was about how it was really forgiving. Um, Control Z is my best friend and my worst enemy because it both allows me to take no responsibility for what I draw, but at the same time allows me to backtrack, pull my steps back and start over. So the perfectionist in me loves it, but at the same time, the artist in me gives me a little constrained. Uh, I also think there's a lot more exploration that can happen. Uh, with, uh, with, the, with these tools, because you're really only limited by your imagination and the tools that you're given. So however you decide to draw and whatever you decide to build out, that's pretty much based, you're only really limited by, the, by your hardware and your software. That's it. Uh, I feel like any investment you make in doing digital art uh, will last you a long time. Uh, whether it's an iPad with a pencil, whether it's a Wacom tablet. I've had one Wacom tablet for 12 years and it still works. So it's a, you know, it, it's not, not fancy, but it always gets the job done. Uh, and, and that's the other thing, like they, it doesn't go away. Like I, I've stepped on it 
I've thrown it in the back of my car and it just, they, they work. Uh, some of the cons about digital though, is it is kind of the opposite of what we value in traditional, where it's, sometimes you get like creative paralysis where you're just staring at an empty screen and you have no idea where to start. Versus traditional, sometimes the confines of the paper or the texture of the paper or the reality that you're in will inspire you. Uh, digital usually requires more of your focus. So sometimes it's hard to find inspiration uh, in your surroundings. Uh, um, the other thing is, is there's no real original. So uh, these, these next two kind of go together where because people intrinsically have value in original artwork that is unique, unable to be copied, and has that value assigned to that rarity based on what everyone else perceives it to be a value, people see digital art as being less important or less worthy, uh, even though it takes just, amount, just about the same amount of skills and time and effort and uh, you know, levels of like learning anatomy and shape and form than it would for any other type of artwork. But at the same time, people say, oh, well, you, you made it on the computer. So people tend to kind of oversimplify that. So let's talk about the different types of digital illustration in the world today. You've got uh, your raster or pixel-based art. That's pretty much anything Photoshop related. Uh, you know, a, a picture you take on your phone, that's, a, you know, JPEG, PNG, TIFF. Uh, they're all based on little tiny squares that are pixels. And each one of these has billions or trillions of potential color representations. And you're only really confined by how many squares you can fit on your page. However, vector or math-based art is the opposite of that, where because it's all equation based, anything could be uh, 10 to 16 pixels this big or as big as a house. It doesn't matter because each line is going to be perfect because it multiplies every time it's moved. Um, 3D models and sculpted art is kind of the combination of the two, uh, where you have these vector forms that are on three axes, X, Y, and Z, and then you have raster art wrapped around it called a texture. So these are a little bit, it, it's a more of an emerging area, uh, but I mean, you've seen it anywhere from movies to toys to cars to uh, everything. Everything is done in 3D now. Almost, there is so very little that's done in, uh, in, in traditional space when it comes to art. Uh, more and more people are moving to digital because of how versatile, simple, long lasting, and basically all the points I just went through. So there's a lot of potential for it that really only is limited by what you wanna make and how much money you got to spend. So let's talk a little bit about the hardware that you need. Uh, there are two different kinds of tablets. There's connected tablets and then there are standalone tablets. And I put these in two different categories, mostly because there's the ones that, uh, like I said, the old school Wacom Intuos that I have that's 12 years old, that's just a flat tablet. It's just a piece of plastic and it records um, the pressure uh, with a magnet. So it takes one of these little pens and the more you push, the more it will push into the, into the screen. So these are great because there's no battery in them, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there are some really reputable companies out there on a, there, and it's a real range of a budget, but it really kind of depends on what you want to do and how you want to work. If you prefer to work in an office or at home or attached to a laptop or a desktop, I recommend starting out with one of the lower end connected USB tablets. Huion and XP Pen have some really great ones that started even like 20 or $30. They're, they go on sale pretty frequently and they're not too bad. Wacom is pretty much the standard when it comes to these tablets, period. They're the first ones to come up with it. I think they have the best and most responsive technology. Uh, however, the iPad Pro, is a close second. This has been my best portable doodle pad for the past couple of years and I'm absolutely in love with it. However, I also have one of these. So this is a tablet from Wacom called the Cintiq. So I can draw right on this, which you'll be seeing later. So there's a few different options depending on what you like and uh, you know, what you have access to, but the biggest differentiators that I've found have been pressure sensitivity, how big they are, uh, what they work with, uh, what you have for money, and whatever the pen technology that comes in, uh, that you know, kind of whatever they're, they're, they make different kinds of pens. So here's the two 
that they have. This is the Apple Pencil 2. This is actually battery powered and requires both hardware and software on two different levels to be able to record what you're trying to input on the iPad Pro. This from Wacom is powered by a magnet and never, ever, ever needs to get recharged. Now let's talk about software. This is where it gets a little bit more sticky. There's a lot of stuff out there that you could potentially choose from. There's things that are industry standard, like Adobe. They have some fantastic programs from the old school. Like you can paint in Photoshop. You can draw in Photoshop. Illustrator is Illustrator, <laughs> uh, but it is mostly, you know, vector. So if you're not familiar with that or that's not really your style of work, then, you know, then there are other options. Adobe has actually come out with this new one called Fresco, which is a digital art media simulator, which means it simulates different types of watercolor, oil, acrylic, and ink. So if you really want to have that experience as far as like, I want to be able to, you know, uh, paint, but I don't want to go out and spend three, four hundred dollars on a bunch of oil paints. If you've got an iPad, you've got a pencil, it comes with, uh, it, it comes with your, your app uh, subscription. Some of the other ones I'll recommend are um, Procreate, and if you're on a real budget, Krita, Medibang, and even Autodesk has a sketchbook. Uh, that, that's, uh, they have a sketchbook version that's free. However, my go-to these days is a Japanese program called Clip Studio. This is an amazing program that we're actually going to, I'm going to show you guys later, that has raster, vector, and 3D built all in together. And it's basically meant solely for illustration. So uh, again, differentiators of these is how much cloud storage do they come with? What are the different layers, functions, and styles that they're able to have? Um, resource requirements. I mean, do you need a, a beefy computer or can you run it on a tablet or your phone? Uh, again, you know, is it raster, is it vector, is it 3D? Do they, do they work together? Um, is it more media simulation or precise where you have this, uh, where you're able to, you know, uh, be able to experiment with random types of reactions, uh, you know, like throwing salt on watercolor, you can actually do something like that in Fresco versus having something like Illustrator where every single line is perfect. And then does it work on every device? So now let's talk about how to draw. Now, I know this is really oversimplified. However, these are the things that people miss. Everyone starts out saying like, I want to draw something. I want to draw this bowl of fruit. I want to draw this person sitting on a subway bench. I want to draw this building. You never hear somebody say, I want to draw a bunch of lines. I want to draw a circle. I want to draw a cube. The only time you were thinking about drawing a cube was when you're in middle school. <laughs> when you discovered like, oh, if I draw these three lines together, I can make a box. Uh, or like the, like that S thing that people used to make in, in, in school. Uh, these are all really interesting concepts, but it's the most baseline that you need to be able to have if you really want to be able to illustrate. Anytime you want to draw something, it's important to know what kind of tools you're working with. So regardless whether it's Photoshop, if it's Krita, if it's Clip Studio, if it's Illustrator, you need to know how to make a line. You need to know how to make a curved line. You need to know how to make a squiggle line. You have to have intent. Otherwise, because if you don't know what kind of tools you're working with, it's really hard to be able to figure out how to get from there to what you want to put on the page. Shapes, I think, are the second step because you're connecting lines together. Line, you can imply, and it can be messy, and it can be ugly, but at the end of the day, you still want to, it's still around shapes themselves. So once you kind of understand what shapes are and how they act, then you're able to move from shapes to forms. Forms are the simulation of two-dimensional objects that appear to be in 3D. This is a really important step, but this is the one that most people miss because it's actually pretty difficult unless you have a little bit of help. And that's basically uh, being able to get access to things like perspective rulers uh, or, you know, or different, some help along the way. So let's take a look at some stuff. I'm not going to sit here and just chat at you all day. I'm actually going to show you what I got in mind. So this is Clip Studio Pro. Um, love it. Fantastic software. This is, the, this is what does 3D raster and vector. I'm going to show you how to use all three of them in the next few minutes. So let's say I want to drop a three-dimensional model in here. 
this uh, Clip Studio accepts OBJ and various other ones, so, but it comes with quite a few. I've already dropped a model in and kind of show you what the potential is. So this model is just a standard doll and you're able to kind of move them around as you need them. So if you wanna be able to get a certain pose, you can move the model and then move the camera. So let's say you're not as confident in using uh, in, in, in anatomy or whatever and you just wanna draw, this is a great way to start. Now there's nothing saying you can't actually trace this or, or use it as reference because both of those things people kind of get in your face about and both of them are wrong because if you're just starting out and you're barely learning how to use your tools, absolutely trace, trace away, but let people know that you did it. So that way, you know, they can either help you with the comparison and be able to give you some really great, you know, uh, critiques and feedback to grow and learn. Um, and also, you know, to be realistic about where you are in your uh, process of where you want to be. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of 3D models. I think they're incredibly flexible. I think they're incredibly easy to use. And it's basically just a wooden doll that has a little bit more detail in it. So I've already picked out a model that I want to use. And it's this one. Don't have a ton of time today, so we're going to be really quick about this. So you're getting a portrait. So I've got this one model, and I want to be able to apply what we were just talking about. So if I wanna kind of block this out, you know, I would just take my pencil and start making shapes. Well, head's a circle, right? Yeah, head's a circle. And the neck, neck's a line, so put a line in there. Shoulders are like circles, so put one there and put one there. And then let's connect them. So shoulders are connected and neck is kind of like a cylinder and then you've got the shoulders and let's add some contour lines onto this to make it look like it's an actual shape so after spending a few minutes on it you know you get your basic shapes here and it's really easy to kind of say like okay i've got a real rough outline so you know what no more 3d model so if I wanna refine this, all I have to do is pull the opacity down and draw over it. This is really what I do with every single one of my pieces. When I wanna be able to refine something, I just grab my pencil and I say, you know what? I kind of have my shapes. Now I'm using my own sketch as reference. So I can go in and say, you know what? Let's, uh, you know, let's kind of just refine the shape so it's a little bit more head-like. Um, See, the ear would probably go here. This area would be where the eyes are. The central area of the head would go here. Uh, put a nose here, put a mouth there. You know, just generally clean this up. And by the time I'm usually done, it looks a little bit more like this, where I'm actually able to go in, I've refined my shapes, I have some really, really sketchy outlines of what I think it's gonna look like uh, for the next step. And this is, and what I've kind of done here is blocked out to say, you know what? I've got this area where this is where the face is. I've got this area where the eyes should be. And the nose would probably look similar to this. And then again, I'm just using my guides. Then you get rid of them. Now let's refine this one. So you pull the opacity down for this. And then start getting in and cleaning it up. So as I'm doing this, like you'll see that it's starting to take a little bit more shape. So a little bit more detail, but not a lot but enough so you can see that there's like gonna be a little bit of a difference. So let's say I'll add the pupil for the eye and put the nose in and let's add the mouth. And I'll do this one. So it's really just refining. So as, as you become more and more accustomed to drawing, you'll 
you'll, you'll kind of see that there are patterns, that there are pieces that you'll recognize consistently. So if you draw a face once, you'll I'll say, okay, the eyes go at the top, the nose goes in the middle, and the mouth goes at the bottom. The next time you draw a face, you'll say, okay, the eyes and the nose are, have, a, have a significant amount, they, they have a consistent amount of distance between them. So you'll be able to use that as reference to say, okay, if the eyes go here in conjunction to where the ears are, then you'll know that the ears will always need to line up with the eyes. So it's kind of like when you were driving, or I don't know if anyone else has had this, when you've had a driving test, they kind of give you like reference points. Like if you look through this window at this point and you, and, and you put the line at that point, then your car, will, the wheels will be like on the line. I don't know. That, that's, that's something, I don't know. It's a personal experience I had, but uh, it always kind of stuck with me where it's, if you have a reference point, you can continue to like make headway on it. So the more you kind of refine into it and build, more of what you're trying to come up with ends up taking shape. And the more you draw it, the more confident your strokes will be. So then you'll just be able to kind of say, you know, like, okay, well, you know, lower lashes and let's add to the pupil and let's see, nostril and then one of these and one of these. And then, oh, we need the little eye folds that come between the eyes and those round out the head. Nope, that's not right. Round out that. So we're getting there, we're getting there. And then eventually it'll look something like this. So now I've got my structure, I've got my hair, I've got all these different pieces that I'm able to start really, really getting into. So let's say I wanna start adding more of a form element to this. So because I've already built out my shapes and I've kind of rounded everything out in the way that I'm, I understand shapes to act, now I need to figure out how the light's gonna hit this. So let's say, let's say the light's coming from over here. Now the head, if you look at it, like at, from this particular angle, if the light was shining this way, this area would be a lot more, a lot darker. So if we cut the face in half, along this line, everything on this side is gonna be darker because the light's coming from here. So it looks something like this. So this way you have a little bit of, uh, you've, you've got your, you got things a little bit, what they call rendered. And this actually comes from 3D, is that when you are rendering things using light, uh, this is where form comes in the most important um, because the way light interacts with shapes in conjunction with shadow is really complicated and as you explore and get into this it'll get more and more into it and as soon as you get into painting you'll deal with ambient occlusion you'll deal with bounce light key light highlights uh, you know different kinds of absorbing shadow it's a lot it's a lot to bring in however this didn't take long and even though I kind of pre-built quite a bit of this, this whole link, this, all this, all this put together probably only took me about 15 to 20 minutes to do a little while ago. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the session is I'd like to be able to answer some questions and I'm going to do so while I do line art. And the reason why I'm saying that is because this is where the vector part comes in. So if I want to be able to uh, line this or use a black pen, I would be able to, you know what? I don't like that line, but I can move it around if I want. This line is completely able to be changed. I can attach a new brush to it. I can simplify it. I can connect it to other brushes. Uh, the line will actually even continue if I place it in the right space. Uh, but this is probably one of the best things about Clip Studio is that if you do make mistakes on any type of level, you're able to quickly go in and just move the line. So if I want to start on this eye, just 
just start blocking it out. Adding lashes as I go. Keep my edges nice and smooth. And let's finish the iris, add the pupil, and this would be the highlight from the sun. Let's add a couple more highlights from there. back out. Now you can see how clean it is. And that is basically what I have to show today. Uh, I know it's it was a lot and I know that there's uh, still quite a bit uh, to go, but I am going to finish this while we have our discussion. And if anyone has any questions, just throw them out. Happy to answer.